sense, it does matter that, that I'm female. Yeah, I yeah. think it had an effect on the way it was in the media that right. I was female. Right. Yeah. And sometimes um, I discuss with my friends, like, you know, if I was fat and ugly, um, you know, maybe the story wouldn't have had much traction. Who is Lindsay Shepard? From my understanding, she is a Canadian student, a former student that was studying academia. But why is she important? I'm going to do a very shallow dive into Lindsay Shepard. So I saw a video of her and just like any other person wanted to know more about her. Who is behind this pretty face and great smile? So I ran into one video where she kind of explained where she got her start. I'm going to let her tell her. Yeah, so um, back in 2013, this is right after I'd graduated high school really, Jordan Peterson reached out to me right, and he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Right. Would you like to be a right wing operative? Right. Oh, okay. Okay. As you can see, she is a right wing operative that was recruited by Jordan Peterson. Actually, that's not even true. Uh, it is true that she said that, but she was actually joking at this conference that she was at. Um, actually, her fame was she was being disciplined and recorded. Now, she was being disciplined because she did not take a stance against evil Jordan Peterson. And the reper repercussions of that is that she was bullied by three professors or two professors and a equal opportunity officer or whatever. I don't know. I'm not into college, so I don't even know what those are. But she uh, did what most people should do when they go to the university, which is branch out and challenge their themselves and actually find themselves and she was looking online or I don't know where she actually initially saw the clips but there's a Canadian broadcast channel which had Jordan Peterson and one other person and she thought that was a interesting topic because she was a TA at this university as well so she uh, took a couple of clips from that interview to go over pronouns in basic English languages and she was taking something that was current and trying to apply it to her class. Apparently the uh, professor did not like that and disciplined her and she felt the need to protect herself or whatever and record it. And one thing led to the other. Um, it was talked about and there's a big fiasco or a scandal or whatever you want to call within the Canadian higher education. Um, but she actually highlights an issue that I'm seeing, which is just not isolated. It's almost global between the Western civilization, that is uh, Europe and Northern America, which I just want to go into a little bit deeper dive, and I'm going to be using a lot of her clips or clips of her that I found online. So while watching this clip, there's something else that struck me kind of interesting. I'm going to let uh, Lindsay Shepard describe it in, in her own words. I see self-censorship as one of the biggest problems, and it's something I did throughout my entire undergrad. And I would even walk away from class and really wish I said something or challenged something, but I, I barely ever did. Um, and so that's something we really need to stop. So because don't self-censor? Don't. Yeah. That's right. The uh, self-censorship that we're doing in this culture, the extreme political correctness where we can't say something that even a hint terrible or bad could be blown out of proportion um, I don't necessarily agree with that and then that's something that we really do need to speak out against I mean we really need to acknowledge that political correctness is going too far it's going too extreme like I said watching these videos really didn't waken me up to these ideas I've already had those ideas but seeing someone that young that's experienced something this traumatic, going through this and explaining this, very um, kind of deep, personally re rewarding for me, because it shows that there is a dialogue that people are willing to have. And I just like that, the fact that they're exploring that. University campus, we need to learn to be more disagreeable. We can do it civilly. <laughs> <laughs> David Haskell is absolutely correct. We need to be disagreeable or challenge what we're being told. I mean, we need to say, 
is this what we want to do? Is this how is this beneficial? I'm I'm being kind of vague right now. I mean, there, there's definitely things that we really shouldn't challenge. Uh, certain laws that keep us safe that are proven to be useful. We don't want to try to challenge those, but definitely when we're dealing with the political correctness and the weaponization of political correctness, we kind of need to kind of take a disagreeable stance or maybe a more challenging stance or a more critical thinking uh, stance to be like, what is the benefit of saying this opposed to this? I mean, I grew up in a period where the local correctness was kind of starting. I mean, it was kind of the building box blocks what it is today. But pretty much back then, political correctness is don't be a jerk. And that's a good way to live. I mean, don't go out of your way to be a jerk to someone just for the sake of being a jerk. And I'm kind of interpreting what Hugh's saying. I think that's pretty much what he means is when you are confronted with these ideas, challenge them if they don't make sense. Challenge them if you could think that they could cause more harm than what they're trying to protect. And that's something I just found interesting <laughs> watching this video. It made me think of something I hadn't thought of before. So I do research in sociology of religion, and you made me think about, and I don't know where this will go yet, but thank you. So in established religious traditions, you are made to feel guilty about sin, but you also have a way to propitiate that sin if Christianity, you ask forgiveness. If Judaism, there are means. These religious systems say, here, feel guilty, but then here's how to propitiate that guilt. But with social justice philosophy, and I'm using that in, in scare quotes, they definitely know how to make you feel guilty. <laughs> but they really, the way to propitiate guilt is to make other people feel guilty, which is really interesting because I see it as a religious movement. Right, it, and so so that's very interesting to me. I'm going to think more about that. Yeah, I found that really interesting. Where he's talking about the social lawyer justice as movement as a religion, and how in most religion there's a way to repent, but they still make you feel like a sinner or something unmoral, and that's the purpose of the religion in the way that they kind of control you and add spiritual healing. That's just that my interpretation of it. I just found that kind of interesting um, part of the this video. Uh, not the first time I've actually heard that, but the way it was described to me in there, I actually kind of highlighted it, which I found interesting. And hopefully you found that interesting too. Um, yeah, like this whole movement is kind of mind-boggling, but at the same time, when you have, when you look from the outside perspective, you kind of make sense of it in a non-sensual way. I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah, I just found that interesting, that comparison. Quick. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, Lindsay, um, you, things have changed. Your, what happened to you has changed what has happened on campuses. And I just gave a speech about Lindsay's case on Monday to about 40 professors who were in complete agreement with the terrible situation that uh, existed. But at the same time, we have to be very careful here that we can move things forward as a freedom of expression coalition, university-wide, Canada-wide, and there's a real danger if you see it as a right-wing, left-wing dichotomy. Um, I have talked to people from Wilfrid Laurier who said they wanted to speak up in favor of Lindsay, but they didn't because they feared being labeled a right-winger. That's the problem. So if you're going to say um, we want to crush the left and the social justice warriors and all this kind of terminology, you're not going to get the, that middle, that large middle that really wants to support freedom of expression, but they're afraid to do so because they're going to be seen as someone who's on the right. I'm a socialist. I'm not a right winger. Chris, Christy Blatchford's piece in the National Post made it sound as if I were a right wing speaker. This is a huge problem. So if you're going to start talking, and, and the second thing is, these people are not on the left. The people who are claiming to be on the left, who are authoritarians, to politically correct totalitarians, they are not left-wingers. They are using this idea of the left 
to get other people to sympathize with them and to go with them, but they are actually reactionaries. They, they want privilege. They are privilege-seeking groups that d care nothing about equality. They are trying to increase their own power in the university. And that really has to be made clear, because if we keep on saying, oh, these leftists and these far leftists, you're never going to get anyone who sees themselves as being a left-wing person to be a supporter of freedom of expression. And conformity obviously stifles people and their abilities. I emphasize that it's really not in anyone's interest for only one side of the political spectrum to champion free speech, because it really is everyone's issue.